thank you. It's always got to be something. I can't, I can't live that guy down. Uh, well, good morning. Good morning. It is great to see everybody here. Um, thank you, um, President Susi and the speaker. Shirtliff, I remembered your name. <laughs> I was, I was going to throw something in there, but you know. Um, but obviously, honorable members of, of the House and Senate who have joined us here today. Uh, you know, this is one of those rare times. You have so many folks uh, in this audience to really thank who really make uh, a lot of New Hampshire what it is. Uh, we have the members of the, the Supreme Court, the justices, the federal court. We have our esteemed executive council here, which obviously I'm quite partial to. Um, all the members of our, our commissioners and our directors uh, that represent the state, that manage the ins and outs of the business. Um, obviously, there's a lot of friends and family here. Um, it is absolutely great to see them. And um, it goes without saying, um, the one who really makes this all happen, uh, my amazing wife, Valerie. Uh, it's, it, it is an, it's an absolute honor um, when someone, a group of folks, 1.35 million people, uh, put their faith in you and the trust to, to be governor. It's an honor to stand up here. It's very humbling uh, in many, many different ways. Um, I also want to take the moment to really acknowledge, um, you, never can't, you never can say enough, when you talk about having the National Guard in here and our military families and the facts we have, we have folks serving from New Hampshire, both serving abroad and here in country, maybe not in the state with us today, uh, the sacrifices that they make, the sacrifices their family makes, veterans, that obligation that we carry with us, making sure that we're standing by them, for them, providing the services they need uh, while they stand up for us. So to everyone uh, who has or is currently wearing a uniform, thank you. Thank you very much. So as you know, I, I, I do not normally write speeches. So writing a speech is, is always a bit of a challenge, and I'm going to do my best to stick to it. Um, I'll try my best not to ramble on. I see they have sat Ruth Griffin and Ray Wazork next to each other. <laughs> right? Someone gets it. Um, so if I see them nodding off, I know I've gone too long. Um, <laughs> I love you guys. Well, Ray's like Valerie's boyfriend. Ruth is like my girlfriend. It all works out. Um, uh, in November, you know, uh, the voters in this state, not just for governor, but as they came out, whether it was for the county seats, or the state seats, or the House, or the Senate, they really set us on a path. Uh, and it does require that we, as state leaders, come together, truly embrace a spirit of cooperation, work together to get things done for the state of New Hampshire. And we have to remember that there are 1.35 million people counting on that, and they truly deserve nothing less. We were sent to Concord to fix problems, to create opportunities, and to embrace the power of the individual. And I talk about that a lot. Make no mistake, we've made great progress in the past two years, but there is surely a lot of work to be done. In just the last two years, we've established things like full day kindergarten. We signed the most comprehensive child welfare bill in the state's history. We provided tax relief for small businesses. And with the implementation of our new hub and spoke model, now known as the doorway, this very week, opening their doors across the state of New Hampshire, we've created opportunities for us to truly tackle one of the state's biggest crises, the opioid epidemic. We worked together, bipartisanly, in a way that, frankly, was a moment of real pride, I think, for all of us in the last session, when we decided that we wouldn't let partisanship come in the way and we'd make sure that 50,000 Granite Staters, low-income Granite Staters, those who are out there doing everything they can to make a living, to provide for their families, we made sure that they will have health care through our expanded Medicaid program. And we have to remember it's not just what we've done, it's really how we did it. We did it in our own way, in an innovative way. We did it putting forth a strong work requirement 
which gives people the dignity of work. We've saved hundreds of million dollars in the system. We've become a model, frankly, for other states to emulate when it comes to managing and simply providing the best services to our citizens. We But when we look back at what we've accomplished, we can't lose sight of why we're here. As I said, in public service, it's just as important as, as how you get there as the goals that you achieve. In New Hampshire, we know we're best when we work together, and that's obviously what we must do. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Libertarian, we all share a passion for making our communities the strongest they can be, a commitment to making sure that New Hampshire simply remains the best place to live, work, and raise a family. I've often said that we do not let the dysfunction of Washington, D.C. define the successes here in our great strait. And it is true that politics does not and should not dictate policy. We treat each other with respect, with civility, not like some of the circus theatrics we see about 800 miles south of us. I did travel down to Washington recently, though. Um, I spent some moments honoring one of America's true heroes, someone who really understood what public service was about. And to be down there following President Bush's passing, I think for everyone, not just myself, but I think I can speak, it was truly a reminder across the country what good public service was really about, what giving of yourself really was. Getting out of your comfort some, sometimes and, and doing the right thing, it's not always easy, but in terms of leadership and whether you're a House member, whether you're a governor, whatever it might be, it's a, it really incumbent upon us to lead by example. And when you look at what President Bush did, how we treated people, how we truly treated people, it's kind of like, as we say, he did it the New Hampshire way. He talked to you as an individual. He listened to your issues. And he let people drive the policy needs of, of the country. And again, that four or five days where it was sad to be sure, but I think everyone was able to take a deep breath, pause, and remember what real good public service was all about. It isn't always about going after funding. It isn't about picketing and protests. It's truly about bringing people together. Uh, a very smart man once said, it is our choices that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. And that quote really rings with me. That wise man, I'm not going to lie to you, was Dumbledore from the Harry Potter series. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But it is true. It is our choices. And that's what good public service is all about. I also recently saw an interview about a month ago with another great New Hampshire native, I'm a big fan of, Adam Sandler. And it was interesting to hear him reflect a little bit on his life and his career. And he, he said something, he said, well, I wasn't a kid growing up thinking that one day I'll get an Oscar and stand on a stage and make speeches, that just wasn't who I was. And I thought about that a little bit, and I, it, for me it, it kind of rang very similarly, to be honest. Um, you know, growing up, I think a lot of you know I'm number seven of eight kids, and I'm proud to be here with a lot of my brothers and sisters, and my parents are here today. Um, and public service isn't something just in our family. It's New Hampshire, right? It's, you, we're all here. We're all public servants. It's what we do. It's in our blood. It's in our communities, right? Whether you're a teacher, whether you volunteer at a nonprofit, right? It's about giving of ourselves. Now, in the public, in the, I guess, the political sphere, if you will, there was something that resonated with me when I heard that quote. Um, this is where I'm going to tell a story and then probably embarrass myself more than my family, but I think it was 1980. It was the U.S. Senate race. My father was running for U.S. Senate, and no, he didn't win. Um, and of all things, we'd get pulled around to a lot of different events here and there. And one of the events, I never liked to go. I was incredibly shy. I would believe it or not, I was really incredibly shy, as my mother can attest to. I was like the kid holding on to my mother's leg, praying I didn't have to go out on a public stage or anything. And one day we were taken to an event, and I was probably six years old at the time, and I wasn't really paying attention, and we got there, and no one was really telling me what we're doing. I was just kind of hanging around in the back, and I quickly realized this was a fashion show. <laughs> Whose brilliant idea this was to parade kids out in a fashion show, I don't know, but when they pulled out the blue plaid suit and said, this is what you're going to wear, get on out there, and no matter how much I cried and protested, I was forced out there. People were laughing too, I don't know. I thought it was pretty cruel, frankly. But, but I remember thinking, I was six years old and I promise you, I remember thinking, if this is what politics is about, I don't want any part of it, right? And that, trust me, that has stayed with me. 
You think I forgot? It stayed with me all those years. It's traumatizing. <laughs> but it was, in, any, in many ways, um, I think it was part of the lesson of being in New Hampshire. My parents knew it wasn't easy for us to go and do all that stuff, and I know it's not easy for my kids and your kids, for those who are elected officials in the public sphere, especially now more than ever, whether it's social media or the negativity of the partisanship, it's not easy on families, it's tough. Ask this one right here, she'll tell you. She could write a book on how hard it is sometimes on families. But it's what we do. It's giving of yourself, it's getting out of that comfort zone, because at the end of the day, we have to remember, the job is bigger than ourselves. It's not about our individual issues, our individual priorities. It is truly bigger than ourselves, and we have to get out of that comfort zone, get out of the walls of the state house, engage with individuals, right? Get into communities, find out what is truly happening out there, and again, let those individuals, those individuals with their stories, drive better policy. So, when we talk about policy, when we talk about good public service, I, I go back to two of the foremost cruxes, the axioms that I, I fall into are management and customer service. Good management, quality customer service. The goal should be create, to cr truly create an inclusive, all and welcoming environment for our citizens so that we can walk out there as public officials, as commissioners, whoever it might be, and say this is who we are and how can we truly help. Therefore, our obligation often is to pull the limits, to really get out of our, outside the box, outside those comfort zones. It's one of the reasons, um, you see, I've been known to partake in various experiences, right? Uh, last week, I was jumping in the Atlantic Ocean with Chucky Rosa to bring awareness to the opioid crisis. And that's not easy in the middle of December, trust me. Or this past summer, I, uh, I did the death-defying feat with Senator Ayotte, who's joining us today, to rappel down a 24-story building. And for a guy who's deathly afraid of heights, let me tell you, it's not easy. But it helps bring awareness. We're raising money for Granite United Way. Last, last year, I joined my commissioners, joined me. George Capatis raised about $15,000 himself, God bless it. And we all slept out on the streets of Manchester to raise money and awareness for homelessness, right? And it gets people involved. It gets people noticing. It gets people understanding how they can become more involved in their communities uh, in a variety of different ways. So there's one uh, story I want to tell you as well. Uh, another organization Valerie and I are very passionate about is Best Buddies. It's a great organization. It builds friendships and social bonds with, for kids with disabilities. Um, and you know, Valerie has really led the charge here in the state with Sarah Dennehy, just done some amazing stuff. But I decided, I have decided, half, half was convinced by Valerie, that I was gonna ride a 50 mile bike ride. Right? To raise, again, to raise money and awareness for Best Buddies, it's just a great organization. And God bless it, a bunch of people joined my team. And two of the individuals that joined my team, there were some folks from the state that joined. Nicole from uh, the Liquor Commission joined. And uh, two of our newest members of state government, uh, Christine Tappan, uh, who is the, I'm gonna get the title wrong now, Associate Commissioner at the Department of Health and Human Services, and Christine Brennan, who's our Deputy Commissioner of Education. Uh, neither of us had ever really ridden bikes for any appreciable time, uh, any appreciable length, and so we'd do these practices, and one day we're out there practicing and we're riding, and I'm just trying to, I think all of us, we're just trying to not like fall in a pothole or hit dirt and flip over and the whole thing, and at one point, um, I don't think I told him I was going to tell the story, but I don't care, uh, Chris, so Chris Tappan is here, and Chris Brennan is there, and I'm in the middle with like the three Chris's going down the road, and again, I'm just trying to keep it all together, and they're chatting back and forth. And they had this amazing conversation, and it was about what was happening at Health and Human Services with child welfare, with some of the exciting things, how we're transforming DCYF, the programs that are there. And Chris Brennan is talking about the things at education and how a lot of those programs are similar. And how sometimes, you know, you get an email or they, they'll get a phone call between de departments, but there were actually individuals in those departments that had never met the other individuals in the other departments but they were working on very similar things, and it was this amazing moment. And uh, within weeks, uh, Valerie uh, heard the story, and she opened up the Bridges House, and they brought their teams together for the first time in a long time, and really brought them together to share ideas within government. And I think a lot of folks, a lot of times we take it for granted, but you gotta make sure the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, right? So there's not duplicative of efforts, there's not conflicting efforts, frankly. So there's a sharing of ideas and really opening uh, uh, the up of, uh, opening up of possibilities. And when, when that happened, I, that was one of the things I said, well, I gotta keep doing this stuff because you never know what the next adventure might bring. But it really was amazing, we didn't fall, by the way. 
I was a little paranoid of that. I, I didn't know if there was like going to be some sort of human resources issue because I had pressed them into service if they had fallen and gotten hurt. But, um, but it really was, was, was quite an amazing, amazing moment. And it, it, it set a tone and a, and a lesson for a lot of our other commissioners, right, to challenge ourselves within the departments. Remember, we have 10,000 state employees out there. It's a lot of folks doing good, hard work. But you got to challenge. you got to challenge the directors. you got to challenge the division heads, right? What are you doing? How are you doing it? Have you talked to these folks? Can we get together? Can we build relationships? And again, this is not meant as a criticism to any individual department or division or anything, but it's the natural order of things. If you let government just go, it, it tends to fall into silos. It's very easy to folks to keep processing and bureaucracies and fiefdoms, but it's very easy to just keep processing what they need to process without stretching a little bit, without making that extra phone call. And that's really where the efficiency of government can come into play. And ultimately, that truly leads to better customer service, right? better service for those individuals, for those citizens. And you have to notice that, again, there's nothing political in any of that. There's nothing Republican or Democrat here. It's, it's trying to just instill some good management practices. And we have some tremendous, tremendous commissioners working for the state right now. It's an absolute honor every time we get together. There's a good sharing of ideas. They're talking to each other. They're talking to their departments. Right? There's a great checks and balance within that system. Um, and again, whether you're a qualified nominee to be brought before the executive council as a, a judge or on the board of dietitians, or um, maybe some we're going to hire to work in the opioid crisis. Um, it's all about building those personal relationships and making sure that politics doesn't get in the way of simply folks that want to get up and have the qualifications to serve the best, the best they can. I travel to Washington a lot. I, again, I, I don't know if folks know this, but a lot of states hire lobbyists. Governors will hire lobbyists to represent them in Washington, D.C. I didn't know that before I became governor. I don't believe in that. I don't do that. I get on a plane and I fly down there, right? Yeah, it saves you a few bucks. Don't worry. But again, it also simply gets better results. The Republicans love that. But it really gets better results. You know, I'll fly down and we'll sit with individuals and you build relationships so you can not, so when you do have to pick up the phone in a moment's notice, they know who you are. They can picture your face. They know what you're about. They know what the issues of New Hampshire are really are being driven here. And that's allowed us to get a lot of opportunity. And I never understand a lot of the criticism, frankly, that, that we get, oh, he spends too much time in Washington. Well, let me tell you something. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. When the Manchester VA had a crisis, in two hours, Secretary Shulkin was on the phone with us, sending his team up here because he knew us, he knew the need, what the need was, and we've started to really turn things around up there. When there was an issue, uh, I could, uh, we'll go with voc, voc rehab, right? There was, frankly, a big mismanagement of funds and the Voc Rehab Program, a program that provides job training skills to kids with disabilities, was going to disappear. It was going to be gone because a million and a half dollars all of a sudden had disappeared. So I flew down and I sat with Betsy DeVos and I explained to her the issue and they provided a grant to make sure we had that bridge so that, again, we didn't lose those services. When there was talk about drilling for oil off the coastline of New Hampshire, I didn't write a, just write a letter. I got on the plane, I flew down, I sat with Secretary Zinke and assured us that is not going to happen. But that happens again because you build the relationships. Hub and spoke. Let me tell you something. I annoyed the heck out of the White House. I annoyed the heck out of the administration with what I believed we could do with our hub and spoke model. And I gave them the memos and we had our teams go down there and sit with the drugs our time and time. We sat with the president, his administration. And we convinced them, not only did we know what we were doing, but we had a model and a plan, not just for New Hampshire, but something that could be emulated across the country. We received the biggest increase in SOR money, the biggest grant across the country, and they said, we believe in New Hampshire. You're at the tip of the spear, and if we're gonna rebuild an infrastructure, this is where it starts, right here in New Hampshire. And today, those doors are open. And it's not just myself, it's, my, it's the commissioners, it's the, all the folks across the executive branch getting on those airplanes, traveling down with us, building those relationships, and getting stuff done. And the moral of the story is really this. And especially in this world, you gotta be careful. Do not burn bridges, right? You, know, you never know how many times you're gonna have to cross that same river, right? And it's a lesson, again, we talk about partisanship, we talk about working together, bipartisanship. That's a very fine line between those two, but it's truly important. And in New Hampshire, we've done it right. But let's not lose focus. Let's not lose the priority.
to in terms of truly getting stuff done. So one of the key issues that we are dealing with in a very positive way right now is the economy. Our economy is absolutely booming. There is no doubt we are better off today than we were just two years ago. We have the lowest poverty rate in the nation. Business taxes are at the lowest in decades. And more people are truly working than ever before. But again, don't make the mistake and take that success for granted. It wasn't luck. It wasn't happenstance. It was hard work, instilling sound economic principles, focusing on creating strong economic opportunities for individuals, providing employers in the state flexibility and financial opportunity that flows down to the employees and their families. In New Hampshire, we've made a choice. We don't want business investing in government. We want business to retain their revenues and invest in their employees, and they do, and it works. This is exactly why. Look at the results. The model works. Young families, businesses, they're all flocking to New Hampshire. Not by accident, because they are choosing to be here. They are choosing to be part of the business-friendly environment that we've created. That's why we've already seen some of the highest household incomes in the country. Our model of success is working. Tax relief is working. And lowering the cost of doing business through tax relief has allowed businesses to truly reinvest in that workforce. It's a key factor in the wage growth we see when a business can retain its revenue, invest in those employees, and again, it's about that opportunity, not just for the businesses, but it flows to families. It flows to a little more discretionary income in folks' pockets. It flows to a stronger economy for all of us, and it creates opportunity here in the state of New Hampshire. We cut taxes, and we've seen more revenue than almost ever before here in the state of New Hampshire. And we're using those surplus funds for smart, one-time investments. Now, I implore this legislature, please learn from some of the mistakes of the past. The last thing we should be doing is raising taxes or pushing a budget that doesn't live with our, in our means. And it goes without saying, there will be no sales or income tax under my watch. So stay tuned next month on Valentine's Day of all days, because I love the state. I will submit a state budget that keeps our commitment to protecting our thriving economy. It'll continue the current schedule of business tax reductions. It will use practical revenue estimates to ensure that we continue to make investments to improve the lives of every citizen in the state that without jeopardizing our financial solvency. Now, before I jump into the real priorities of the state, when it comes to the programs we want to invest in, what we want to really focus on, let me take a moment and just talk a little bit about what we mean by priorities. Everyone talks about that word a lot. Everyone has a kind of a different interpretation, I think. And whenever I think about priorities, I do think back, there was a point exactly 20 years ago, frankly. I was out hiking the Appalachian Trail. And when you are living in the woods for five months, walking 2,000 miles from Maine to Georgia, let me tell you, you focus on the priorities. It's water, it's shelter, it's food, in that order. That's really it, right? That's survival. And it taught me a lot of lessons, and it, it's really kind of shaped how I deal with a lot of the challenges um, that come before me in my life. It serves as a true reminder that in public service, especially, frankly, in public service, it is important to take time here and there, when convenient, to step back and really reevaluate one's goals and stay focused on results that truly make a difference. We're gonna have our differences in this chamber, in the governor's office, with the, with the executive council. Of course we're gonna have differences, that's okay. And sometimes we're gonna passionately disagree, but it's important to work hard and truly keep a rational perspective on what the priorities of the state are. Now one of the priorities of the state that I think we can all agree on is our workforce needs. When you have more available jobs than ever before and more people working than ever before, we know there are workforce shortages in the state in various areas. And while New Hampshire has clearly become a destination for young workers, one of the immediate challenges 
is how to retain and grow a true thriving workforce for today and the next generation. And many of you have heard me say this before, but uh, those of us that were born here were lucky, and those of us that moved here were smart. <laughs> and recently we saw a new study a couple weeks ago that came out of the Carsey School at, at UNH that was released that shows an increase in young families moving to New Hampshire. It's a very, very positive statistic. And again, it isn't a fluke, it isn't by happenstance. It's because we're creating economic opportunities, we're taking notice, we're pushing the envelope. We have a new Department of Business and Economic Affairs led by Taylor Caswell and his team with Will and Mike Bergeron doing a tremendous job picking up the phone, going after businesses, showing them the very positive regulatory environment, the very positive tax environment that we're creating here. And people are taking notice all across New England. And again, whether it's Hitchner and Milford or Lonza and Portsmouth, BAE, in Merrimack, Madeira in Guilford, Allegro in Manchester, Oxenova in Colebrook, Hubbard Farms in Walpole, the list goes on. These are businesses that are moving here, that are growing here, that are expanding here, that are investing their dollars in our communities and in our families. Now, what, what can we do? What is the role of government here when we talk about workforce? I think that environment that we can create, it starts obviously with education. And we've made some great investments in education, whether it's our career schools, opening up opportunities at the high school level, all the way up into the graduate level. And next month, I'm very proud that we will be proposing the single largest economic investment into workforce the state has ever seen, specifically in our healthcare workforce, in our nurses, which we know is going to be the single greatest need of the state over the next 10 years. We're going to invest $24 million and we're gonna double the number of graduates in all of these areas for our state. Now another key component of growing our workforce is New Hampshire's work requirement for able-bodied individuals who are part of our Medicaid expansion program. The provisions of Medicaid help lift people out of poverty by empowering them with the dignity of work and self-reliability. They help people gain skills necessary for long-term independence and success and entrance into the long-term workforce. We have designed a New Hampshire solution that was the result of a strong bipartisan agreement and this legislature needs to be sure not to obstruct its implementation. I know that leaders in both parties, both parties stand united in ensuring that we are committed to the compromise reached last year to help ensure health care for 50,000 individuals in our state. And, and let's remember, in approving the work requirement, it was actually the administration in Washington that insisted on more flexibility for our citizens, insisting on flexibility for that would include volunteerism, or job training, or part-time work, or simply going to school. All of these now count toward the work requirement. And it's more flexible now than the bill we even passed last year, and that is a win for New Hampshire citizens. You know, I also believe it's time that we look at reforming a lot of our various public assistance programs. We have to ensure that they're a ladder out of poverty, and not a roadblock to those who want to work hard and simply get out of the system. A common hurdle for both businesses and workers is what we call the cliff effect. Last year I had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time at various shelters across the state. Um, if you've had a chance to visit some of the shelters, they're all a little bit different. And it's an amazing opportunity. You hear a lot of different stories, not just from the managers of the shelters, but from the individuals. And about a month ago, um, Valerie had invited a group of the shelter managers to come and visit at the Bridges House. Uh, Valerie has done this amazing thing where building bridges with the bridges, I think is what she calls it, where she brings in groups, I think is a great name. You know, we bring in groups, nonprofits, organizations, individuals, right? And we use the Bridges House as kind of a gathering place to share ideas, to hear real firsthand stories from stakeholders and, and those individuals. And in this group, we brought in some of the folks that manage a lot of the shelters across the state. And when we asked them, you know, what is the single biggest issue, the single biggest challenge facing, and in this case, a lot of the women in the shelters, a lot of them are single moms, a lot of them are in tough situations, maybe they're in recovery, maybe they're in abusive relationships, right? They're getting some public assistance now in various ways, but they said the number one issue was that fiscal cliff. 
that these individuals, again, often young, single moms, some in trouble, some in tough domestic violence situations who rely on government assistance in their time of need, they want to work their way off those programs. They want independence. They want an escape, but they find themselves trapped or discouraged from accepting better job opportunities because their increased incomes will cut them off completely from assistance in a moment's notice. The results are that those individuals have declined promotions. They've declined better jobs. They work fewer hours. And unfortunately, believe it or not, they've actually remained in abusive relationships or tried to hide their incomes so they could maintain eligibility for programs. Instead of encouraging employment advancement, our system right now incentivizes people to remain, out, remain on state support. And yes, this might make some sense in the short term, but in the long term, we end up harming the people who often need the most help, and frankly, the dynamic simply makes no sense. And working together, I believe we can create revenue-neutral reforms to end the cliff effect in our state. We can provide more reasonable off-ramps. We can provide more reasonable off-ramps for these individuals a way to, that encourages the dignity of work, a way that saves rather than costs taxpayers, and gives those receiving benefits the greatest gift of economic stability, a good job that allows them the independence to support their family. It won't be easy, but I do believe the past pathway is there, and I'm challenging the legislature to work with us and simply find better results for these individuals. I want to take a moment and discuss a very specific, what I see and I think a lot of us would agree is a very serious uh, public health need in the state of New Hampshire, and that's pediatric cancer. According to the Center of Disease Control, New Hampshire had the highest rate of pediatric cancer between 2003 and 2014. It's unacceptable. It's alarming. And we can't allow the trend to continue. I think we can all agree on that. We have to work together to find answers, create solutions, and lead the way out of the crisis. So in my budget next month, I will use our surplus funds to commission a study once and for all to, de to determine both the extent of the crisis and provide real solutions for the citizens and family of our state. The study will have no partisan agenda and, frankly, no preconceived notions. The mission is simple. Figure out the truth and use the, the data available. Develop sound policies that simply help these kids. Answers are not going to come overnight, but we will make it a top priority of the administration. Now, another significant public health crisis, as we all know, unfortunately, is the opioid crisis. And last year, as we saw, if you've read the news, the overdoses across this country are going up, unfortunately. Now, God bless it, here in the state of New Hampshire, we've actually seen a decrease in overdoses. We're actually bucking that trend. It is a good sign, it is a great sign, but we know there's a lot more work to do. And as we mentioned this week, just a few days ago, 211 took their first calls to triage individuals uh, just after New Year's. The hub and spoke model went live. Nine locations across the state opened the doors. We're calling it the doorway. Um, it's just getting off the ground. It's exciting, working together, really seeing what the needs are across the state. The idea that you finally don't have to travel 200 miles out of Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, down to Manchester to get the type of care, the type of treatment, the type of recovery that is going to work for you. To have these hubs across the state working in folks' individual communities so they don't have to worry about being separated from their job or their family. It's an incredibly exciting time. It's a New Hampshire model and someone I think we should all be proud of. And when you combine that with what we're doing with our Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative, which had a very exciting, we crossed a very exciting milestone, the fact that we have, for the first time in a long time, a fully funded alcohol fund with over $10 million sitting available and flexible to provide a lot of these spokes, to provide a lot of the services in the individual communities, 
in both the southern tier and across, whether you're in Monadnock, whether you're in Coas, the funds are, are available, the tools are available. We have more tools, we've created more tools, frankly, than we've ever had at our dis disposal before. The trend is going in the right way. We're creating an infrastructure, not just for the next two years, but truly for the long term. And that's very exciting. And the Recovery Friendly Workplace, I, I want to I wanna brag about it a little bit. I'm governor, I get to brag every once in a while. It's working, it's exciting. And we crossed our 40,000th employee. 40,000 employees now work in a business that proudly calls themselves recovery friendly in just a few months. It's wonderful. So again, whether, I just want to reemphasize whether it's a public sector solution, a private sector solution, working with nonprofits, working in the government agencies, whatever it might be. It's all there on the table for us. There's still a lot of work to do. But again, we'll keep working to build the system and win the war on drugs. Now, just two short years ago, we had another very significant crisis when we took office. And that's the one we all know about over at the, at the time at the Division of Children, Youth, and Families, DCYF. It was in crisis. We needed new management, we needed more caseworkers, we needed more funding, and at the end of the day, it all just meant that children were at risk. So what do we do? Well, I believe that turning around an operation be begins with leadership. And so first what we did is we brought in a, a world-class team. And I, I tell this story a little bit, but it's, it's so true. Of all places, we looked, we went to New Jersey. No, you can laugh, we don't do that very often. <laughs> But New Jersey had a model that had turned themselves around. They had gone from one of the worst to one of the best child welfare systems in the country. And they didn't just do it with pouring more money at it. They did it with, again, good management, focusing on caseworkers, focusing on individual needs, regulatory reform. And we went and we plucked Joe Ribsom, uh, who had, was really key and, inst and, and instrumental in transforming New Jersey's program. And we brought him to New Hampshire. We brought Chris Tappen in. Right? We brought Tom Pristow in from Ohio, folks that had real experience with these issues. And we've built a world-class team over there. And then we said, we're going to put in 30 more funding for 30 more caseworkers. We're going to put the funding where it needs to go, not in just blo more bloated management, not the same old thing, but in those caseworkers, those that are spending the time one-on-one, -on -one, that at one time had thousands of backlogs of cases. I mean, think about that. We had thousands of cases that hadn't been attended to. These were potentially kids in terrible situations in their home, and we didn't have the staff to get to it. That was unacceptable. And I commend the legislature. They came together in a bipartisan way. Jeb Bradley, the Democrats, everyone came together. We simply put the best people in the room, found solutions from stakeholders, they told their stories, and we drove what became one of the most comprehensive pieces of child welfare reform uh, the state has ever seen. And I just can't thank the legislature for making that happen. Now, there are surely more challenges. There are. Nothing is completely fixed. And that's a world where we say one is too many. Nothing is ever truly fixed. So we have to stay attentive to it. Now, one area where I do want to put a lot of attention along those same lines is I truly believe we need to reform our foster care system. We have to ensure that the welfare and safety of children is preeminent. We must be their advocates and will continue to stand up for them. This is exactly who we were sent to Concord to fight for. It's the vulnerable, it's the forgotten, the kids in tough situations that are of absolutely no fault of their own, they're counting on us to have a system that can provide protections when needed, that can restore voluntary services into the home to make sure that a child or a family with a problem doesn't become a child or a family in crisis. We know that good foundations are the foundation I'm sorry, good families are the foundation of healthy communities. And therefore, we must ensure that our system is one that attracts and retains those caring families who extend their homes and hearts to foster children. And once we, we retain them, let's get government bureaucracy out of the way so they can simply focus on the kids. They shouldn't be worried about paperwork. They shouldn't be worried about the minutia. They've given of themselves. They've sacrificed their family. They've sacrificed their time. 
They want to focus on those kids and provide them with a better path. So whatever we can do, administratively, legislatively, at the local level, at the state level, simply cutting that bureaucracy, getting out of their way, and making sure these kids are on a better path, again, has to be preeminent with the state of New Hampshire. I also want to recognize the legislature in another area where we have made uh, meaningful, sustained progress in addressing our state's mental health crisis. Again, for a while, I think it was the unspoken crisis in this state, but we've brought it, the issues to the forefront. We're addressing them regulatorily. We've addressed them with funding. We're making sure that we're moving that ball forward, but we know that there is a lot of work to do. And I always saw mental health when I brought the stakeholders in. That was one of those areas where, you know, when something's not working, it doesn't mean you just keep throwing money at it. That's just pushing harder in the same direction, right? You gotta sometimes have the courage and the will to go in a completely new direction. And by bringing the stakeholders in, by convincing ourselves we weren't just gonna do it the same old way and hope for the best, we've really made some meaningful changes within mental health. We started engaging those on the front lines, the stakeholders, the providers, and today in New Hampshire, as a result of their direct feedback, we're rebuilding and re-engineering that entire mental health system, and today we are in greater compliance with the community mental health agreement than ever before. We've added mobile crisis teams, which help divert individuals away from emergency rooms in their communities. It allows them to get stabilized in their communities without having to run to New Hampshire Hospital. We've added 40 more community transitional beds with wraparound services that help support individuals coming out of New Hampshire Hospital. And while we've made, made those great strides in the past two years to rebuild that system, we know there's more work to do. And in the coming weeks, we will be releasing the state's new 10-year mental health plan, which is a practical roadmap to quality mental health care. This year, we'll, and this year, I'm very excited about this one, we're going to accomplish something that has been talked about for decades, but for whatever reason we quite haven't gotten around to. We will move the state psychiatric unit out of the state prison and treat those patients with the dignity and respect they deserve. Now you cannot discuss reforms within the mental health system without acknowledging the issue of suicide in our state. We know that suicide affects far too many of our communities and too many lives are taken from us too soon. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people in our state. And while there's no single answer, there's obviously more that we can do and we will do. Talking about it can be difficult. It can be very heartbreaking. Hearing the stories, asking individuals, families to come in and share their stories. But I think all, a lot of us know that sometimes it is simply one conversation that can save a life. A family in Bosquin, the Dickies, they know the pain of suicide more than anyone should ever have to. And just over a year ago, Paul and Martha Dickey's son, Jason, took his own life. I first met the Dickies at our first robotics competition, actually. And the story they told me was one where they are truly channeling their pain into hope, not just for themselves, but for all of us. And today I'm very proud to announce my support for legislation that Martha and Paul brought to me. It's called the Jason Flat Act, named after yet another individual, Jason Flat, who took his life about 20 years ago. Under the Jason Flat Act, teachers in New Hampshire will complete two hours of youth suicide awareness and prevention training each year. Through the support of the Jason Foundation, the training can be provided at no cost to local districts, at no cost to the taxpayer. We finally have to understand that suicide is preventable. We all have a role to play, and it truly starts with us. Today, 20 states, 20 states have passed this law, and I ask the legislature to get this done.
You know, it goes without saying that, you know, students are experiencing new and more intense kinds of stresses both inside and, and outside the classroom. Helping students with the skills needed to successfully manage that stress and how to understand and manage their emotions, to cultivate empathy, to develop positive relationships, it's critical. It's absolutely critical in helping keep students out of a crisis or a mental health challenge. Scarlett Lewis, who works nationally to promote social and emotional learning. Yeah, I know. I'm good, babe. <laughs> you, you keep stepping on my big line. <laughs> but, but you're right. Remember, always say you're right. But Scarlett Lewis, who works nationally to promote social-emotional learning, what we call SEL in schools, throughout her Choose Love Enrichment Program. It provides educators with free learning tools all the way up through the 12th grade. Scarlett is the mother of Jesse, who was killed in his classroom during the tragedy of Sandy Hook in 2012. <clears throat> She's another wonderful example of someone who's using the power of the individual to make a positive change. And we put an emphasis on SSEL learning across this state last year. My administration has been going to schools all around our state, explaining why the program is important. Several schools have stepped up to be leaders by example. One such school district, which really caught my eye, was Interlinks. And they've taken this program not just within the school district, but community-wide, through the public community. It's really uh, quite exciting. Parents, teachers, counselors, resource officers, school administrators, they've all welcomed this program. And I'm proud to say that as of today, in just a few short months, over 200 schools have now downloaded and are utilizing this program. OK, now you can point around. There she is. <laughs> and we're welcome to have Scarlett here with us today. I swear this was 20 minutes when I read it to myself last night. <laughs> it's not hot in here or anything. You know, we talk about the classrooms. We talk about all the possibility and the potential that we have within the classrooms of our state. New Hampshire's exceptional public education system can simply proudly boast that some of the best teachers, some of the best administrators, and some of the best school districts in the country. It's a, a great source of pride that we should all have. Getting education right will truly go a long way to help maintaining our state's prosperity. It simply means more jobs for Granite Staters, less reliance on federal and state services, higher incomes, healthier citizens. There's no reason New Hampshire should not be the model for the rest of the nation when it comes to education. And over the past biennium, we've increased education grant programs in New Hampshire by over $50 million. And I fully expect the legislature will have a rigorous and thorough discussion regarding the funding for education, and I will be there with you for that discussion. I think it's something we can all agree on when it comes to the formulas, the amounts. It's something that has to be discussed, and we have to get right. But let's be careful. Let us not be so short-sighted as to think that funding is the only thing that must be addressed. We have big opportunities to expand students' access to educational choices, and we must provide additional pathways for students to simply harness their ability as an individual to learn. Last year, I advocated for and I signed legislation to expand the number of outside the classroom experiences and activities that can satisfy a graduation requirement. The Learn Everywhere initiative, it's a recognition that 21st century education system is not found only within the four walls of the classroom. And consider the program. Consider an individual, a student that loves performing arts, and maybe they're taking performing arts classes and programs at the local boys and girls club. Well, that local boys and girls club 
can now apply for accreditation so that student is getting the credit in the after school program that allows them and opens up their time to take other classes or other, other educational opportunities in the school day. It really is a big win for the students of the state. And in keeping with that principle, I'm proud to announce today the creation of what we are calling New Hampshire Career Academies. Working with our community college system's existing funds, our students can now take advantage of an optional fifth year of high school. That will enable them to receive a high school diploma and a certificate and a college associate's degree free of cost to the student. I know, I'm just... It comes with a guaranteed job interview with a manufacturer of choice. The revolutionary idea for the New Hampshire Career Academy is the result of the good work of Dean Graziano over at the Rochester School District. Dean put together a program with the Great Bay Community College for Rochester High School seniors. It has put interested students on a career pathway with one of Rochester's premier employers, Albany Saffron. And it has the possibility across this state now of achieving what so far has eluded so many, a model that does not cost the taxpayer or the educational system any additional money, but makes free college degree available to our New Hampshire students. This And I have to give credit where credit is really due. This innovative program uh, was something that was brought to me by Commissioner Edelblut, his hard work putting it together. He's done an absolute exceptional job. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> Both initiatives that I've just discussed, discussed underscore an important principle Government is not the solution to every problem, but government can help ensure that the doors of opportunity are open at every level. When I took office, it was my firm belief that government should be about empowering individuals, not just institutions. And just two years ago, I stood before you and proposed what I called the Governor's Scholarship Program. The Governor's Scholarship did exactly that. It provided opportunity for students that wasn't there before. We invested in students directly so they could choose the best path suited for them whether it was the community college, or the university system, or public school, or private school, or for goodness sakes, you can use it to get your nursing degree with the Red Cross. These funds are now available, and in its first year, approximately 600 students across the state took advantage, and with the program scheduled to increase about another 20% next year, frankly, I really think the opportunities are endless. Thank you for making that happen. So I'm going to take a moment again and brag about Valerie a little bit. So, because I digress all the time, I was when we were driving in this morning in the snowstorm, and not only was I, I'm always proud of my wife and thinking about the amazing things, and I'm not going to embarrass her too much, but I'm listening to the radio, to Greg in the morning buzz, and I hear Greg, and, is Greg here? Where are you? He's back there. I hear Greg and Scotty battling over who likes, who, who, who likes Valerie more. Um, <laughs> who can blame them? Um, but I talked a little bit about what she did with the Bridges House, right? Building, using the Bridges House, using bridges to build bridges. <clears throat> um, and one of the programs that, I mean, we've brought in veterans groups, we've brought in a lot of folks on early childhood education, bringing a lot of folks together, doing really amazing things. Folks from outside the state sharing their experiences. Again, folks, the early childhood education one was really interesting because you had folks that are here, part of New Hampshire, most, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of folks from school districts, and it was amazing they hadn't met. It was really one of those things where you, I think we take it for granted a little bit. But to bring them together, share their ideas, and really talk about the path that not just the government should be providing, but local communities can provide. There's opportunities, 
right? Those doorways that we can open for these kids, it was great. But another area where there was a lot of fun, uh, she brought in a group called Project Green Schools uh, to the Friends of the Bridges House. And it's a national program and it awards a grant to student-driven environmental and community service projects. And one afternoon, a group of students came in from various schools, various environmental projects that they had taken the initiative on, and it was like a shark tank. There was a panel of judges, we sat there, they presented their environmental projects. One little girl wanted to reduce paper in the classroom, and she was looking for some money to invest in better modems and Wi-Fi in her school. One group of kids wanted to do an outdoor classroom. Uh, they were building a, a pretty significant structure, a high school. It was, it was really impressive. One group was doing something with mobile apps. I mean, cutting edge stuff. And it wasn't just, here's my idea, give us some money. It was really impressive. You saw these kids, they thought about the hows and the whys and what the true end result was, what the cost benefit analysis of these projects were. And whether they were in fourth, fifth, sixth grade or all the way up to high school, answering some pretty tough questions. It was, it was quite inspiring, quite empowering. And we, that was funded really through uh, uh, corporate partners, right? We're able to provide those grants and some of those, I don't know if I'm, uh, it was Walmart at the time, I don't care, I'll just say, Walmart, God bless them. They put up some great money for these kids, right? To invest in these kids, invest in these projects, and again, hopefully get people thinking and, and students thinking across the state for the next generation of projects. And you all know how passionate I am about energy and, and environmental policy. Uh, I was, an, as you, a lot of you know, I was an environmental engineer. I spent a lot of time in the field working with chlorinated solvents and uh, PCE and TCE. PFAS wasn't even a, an issue just 15 years ago. It was amazing. We didn't have the technology. Now we know, and we know the PFAS issue here in this state. DES is, I think, doing a great job working on it, finding it, finding out what we can do. We just released uh, new standards yesterday over at DES, uh, which I think is going to, again, f provide that pathway where we're going to go with some of these issues. But environmental policy and energy policy really go together. Uh, it's, just, it's just kind of the way it is. And when you have some of the highest rates of electricity in the country, the issue, I firmly believe, and I think most people agree, does have to be at the forefront as it really affects every citizen that's stuck paying a bill. That's why we need to cons uh, consider, con continue supporting an all of the above strategy, which is included in our 10-year energy plan. And I've always said you need to view your energy policy through the lens of the ratepayer. And I'll be honest, I hear a lot of talk from legislators and folks running for office. They say, yes, we're going to support initiatives and we're going to lower electricity rates. And then they vote for legislation that raises electricity rates. You cannot have it both ways. That's all we ask. If you want to talk about lowering rates, then I implore you to support legislation that does just that. It's the most vulnerable among us, remember. Seniors, individuals on fixed incomes, those are at the greatest risk of high electric rates. And I, th I think it's time, my proposal, is that we refocus our efforts on them. I'm advocating today that renewable energy initiatives should benefit low income rate payers first and foremost. And whether it's solar or wind or battery or biomass, whatever it is going to be, we need to ensure that the benefits of these well-intentioned, environmentally valuable programs deliver results to the people who are struggling to pay the bill each month. While other states have unfortunately decided to put developers' interests ahead of ratepayers in New Hampshire, we simply have to put citizens first. We do not need to further raise electricity rates or raise taxes to be good environmental stewards. We just need to be smarter about how we spend the money. And when talking about climate policy, I've always said we have to take that three-pronged approach. You have to look at the environmental, the social, the economic impacts to the communities and to the individuals that bear the burden and the benefits of these programs. The Office of Strategic Initiatives and the Public U Utility Commission are currently working out a plan for the multi-million dollar Clean Energy Fund, which is being made available this year. I want to see renewable energy projects for low-income families and communities to be a priority for these investment dollars. Make sure that those that bear the brunt of the cost of renewable energy are the first in line to receive the economic benefits.
Well, New Hampshire has truly sent us to Concord to, Concord to deliver results. And there will be times when we disagree without a doubt, but again, let's be sure we do so in a way that's free from personal attack or unnecessary political rhetoric. We're here for a greater purpose, to represent the needs of our constituents. We can disagree respectfully, we can focus on moving forward in areas where we can find common ground. And it is not always easy. It takes constant vigilance to see some of the tougher issues all the way to the end. But we truly have to be up to the task. And I'm gonna end by telling you another personal family story of ours, one that has become almost lore in our family. So let me take you back, it wasn't six, but it was back to 1985. I was in the fifth grade, and my father, who was governor at the time, uh, we, weren't, we were a big family, we weren't, we weren't prone to taking many family vacations. But that summer, the National Governor's Conference was being held in Boise, Idaho. And we all went, we all went out to Boise. And following the conference, my father had the brilliant idea to pile us into a station wagon and drive across Idaho to see Yellowstone National Park. Tremendous opportunity. And so we piled into this Wally wagon looking thing. And we drive and we see the geysers and, you know, we have a schedule to keep, so we're moving. It's a, it's a long trip. And on the way back, he says, hey, I'm looking at the map and there's this place called Craters of the Moon National Monument. It's only 200 miles out of the way. <laughs> what do you say? And as beautiful as the trip was, as grateful as we were to have the opportunity after five days being crammed in the station wagon, we all said, no, thank you, let's, it's great, we're wonderful, but let's get to Boise. We, we just, we're ready to go home. We've kind of had enough. So my father said, okay, and you know, he was always at the wheel and he was driving through the night. And around 6 a.m., the sun starts to come up as we're pulling into Boise. And we look around and we quickly realize we're not in Boise. <laughs> it literally looks like we're on the moon. <laughs> and we were stunned. We were stunned. I mean, we're crammed in the back of this thing. We're now 200 miles off course. And we, we said, what are you doing? What has this lunatic done to us? And he just smiled and said, you'll thank me 10 years from now. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a moral to the story. And this is all, uh, very much so for a lot of the newer legislators that are, that are here with us. We have a lot of new legislators this session. A lot of folks that have good ideas and propose good bills and they'll get them through committee and they'll take a victory lap. You gotta see it to the end. When your mind is on something, when your heart is in it, don't fall asleep. The big decisions are often made right at the very end before something becomes law, before we initiate, right? <laughs> don't fall asleep in the car, because you trust me, you don't want to wake up at Craters of the Moon. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It is an absolute honor to serve as your governor. And as, I can't tell you how humbling it is. It's an honor to work with the legislature, an honor to work with our esteemed executive council, with our commissioners, with the directors, with the citizens of the state that walk in our doors every single day. Thank you so very much. God bless this great state. God bless all of you. Thank you.